All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Resource Insider Podcast. As usual, I am your host, Jamie Keach, and today I am sitting down with Jonathan Odd, the President, CEO, and Director of Dakota Gold. We are going to talk about a lot of things today. We're going to talk about, of course, the mining industry, as we always do here. We're going to talk about John's background. We're going to talk about the specifics of Dakota, but also we're going to talk about um, you know, how to build a successful gold exploration slash development company in this space, particularly today, which is, as I'm sure many of you know, a somewhat challenging market for both entrepreneurs and investors. And we're going to talk about how the industry is involving in terms of sources of capital and what investors are looking for. All right, John, welcome to the podcast today. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me, Jamie. So, John, starting from the very beginning, uh, you know, you and I met in person for the first time earlier this year, actually on a fishing trip. You know, we'd spoken before, or at least we'd emailed back and forth before. I was familiar with what you'd done, and and we'd had some sort of similar investment interests. But I was excited to meet you, and I was excited to hear a little bit more detail about what you'd been up to throughout your career, and. I thought it would be good to get you on the podcast. So thank you so much for for taking some time out of your day today. Super excited. Where are you from? I've never actually asked you that. So I was born in Montreal and uh, moved out to Vancouver when I was six and uh, have been here uh, most of my life and and did go to university on the East Coast. And, um, you know, I've been here since I finished school in in, uh, 99. And was, you know, the idea always to get into the mining industry was, was that something you kind of grew up seeing in Vancouver? I know I've got many colleagues out here that have kind of had parents or friends of or parents, friends or whatever that kind of saw the, 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 the potential in the space. Was that your story or did you kind of come by it in a different way? Well, actually the first, so I, when I graduated university in 99, uh, I got a job at Wolverton Securities as a broker trainee, mm. uh, in the city here. And at that time, a lot of mining companies were changing their business from mining to tech. And it was yeah, like, yeah. boom. And so I went through this, you know, broker training program, which was, which was great. And really the, you know, within Wolverton's DNA was financing small cap metals and mining. So mm-hmm. a couple of workers there, you know, had done, had done really, really well and were gracious enough for their time. And, and, uh, you know, I kind of learned about cycles and deploying capital at the bottom of a market is kind of how you want to position yourself. But when you're starting out, you don't really have a lot of capital. So you have to kind of, you know, uh, take your lumps and take your time and, 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 and pick your spots. But that's how it was really introduced to me. And I, and I, and I became fascinated with, with, with the industry and the space and, and then really started to focus on, you know, the larger institutional accounts instead of maybe, a relationship with a with a broker or a sales guy or a banker. I, I would I wanted to talk to the people who wrote those kinds of checks. Mm-hmm. And okay, so let me ask a couple of questions. So, one, when you said you know at that time mining companies were turning very quickly into tech companies, you know we saw that something similar to that a couple of years ago when a lot of mining companies turned into blockchain, Bitcoin, it's crypto mining companies. Mm-hmm. Were you kind of like along for that ride when you were starting at Wolverton? Did you get to invest in the tech industry or were you kind of like, okay, new guy, you can deal with the mining companies because no one cares about that right now. And we're going to take the the sexy, the sexy tech companies. Well, it was this crazy ride because, you know, I, I'd made a lot of money for myself at a young age mm. and then I gave it all back. And it was the best lesson you can learn as a single guy, you know, you're educated, you know, you've got a bit of um you know, swagger to you, but then you get humbled and then you learn to appreciate and respect the market and be very humble. And so that was a great exercise to learn, but um, I never really got into, into tech. I mean, there was so much money flowing in. I mean, you were trading it and just facilitating order flow Yeah. and, and then started to learn about, you know, deals and how they were structured. But um, I've always had an interest in mining. So, you know, this is a, kind of a common theme among some of the actually highest performers in the mining space, people that had made a lot of money and then lost a lot of money and the kind of lessons they learned from that. 
we talked to, you know, Marcel de Groot on this, on this uh, podcast a few years ago, he talked about making you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, as a 20 year old in university. And then like completely blowing it up the next day, not the next day, but in mining, you know, Rick rules kind of famous for saying he like levered himself up so badly and, and, you know, blew up everything. And he said, if I just, if I, I knew if I could get to zero, I could be successful again. <laughs> if I could work my way back up to zero, everything would be okay. Like for you, was there like one stock or one particular company that you were like, this is going to be it. This is going to like, this is going to be the big time. And then it kind of turned around on you or was it just the industry as a whole kind of collapsed in on of itself? Well, yeah, I, I, I was fortunate enough to to get to be an early investor you know again very small but when you're putting say five or ten thousand dollars which at that time was was a lot of money for me into some of these companies where when they ipo they're up 10 20 30x your money and if you're able to have free trading paper and and you know you were selling you know but but very common to have a round tripper where you get into something very early on it goes up 10 or 20x and you've got restricted paper mm -hmm. or the turns and then when when your stock is free trading it's back to, you know, where you paid for, or, or in many cases below that. Yeah. Um, and, and it's funny, you talk about getting back to zero. There were a lot of people that, that were utilizing leverage. So, I mean, some of these people owed, you know, the brokerage firms when, 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 you know, the market turned the way it did. Yeah, that's, um, that's a dangerous game, I would say in the, in the junior mining space. And, you know, what you kind of talk about is something I've I've witnessed in a lot of my peers, a lot of my mentors, myself, is kind of the natural uh growth curve of of um a mining investor. You 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 mentioned the idea of cheap paper, right? And that's kind of is 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 like the gateway drug into the industry that people see that like first they're buying cheap stocks, you know, through their brokerage account. And then they spend enough money. Then all of a sudden their broker says, well, have you ever thought about doing a private placement? We can get you in on this deal. And don't worry, it's with these guys. And these guys know what they're doing and blah, blah, blah. They've done it 10 times before. And, you know, they get their five cent stock or 10 cent stock or whatever it might be. And, they, you know, it goes up and they sell it at 25 cents or a dollar. And then all of a sudden it seems real easy. Like you've, you've kind of figured out the, you figured out the formula. You just buy this cheap stock. And away you go. And that works for typically very narrow time windows. And often to your point, those time windows tend to be less than four months. And in the case of these companies where your stock is locked up for four months, that's not long enough to sell it. And so almost everyone I know has gone through a period of being enticed by this and then being burnt very badly with it. And then the smart ones uh, make the transition to saying, okay, you know, enough of this penny stock bullshit, like, let's focus on real companies, real discoveries, real mines, real deposits, things that like can create actual hard rock value, not just perceived paper value. And did you kind of go through that transition, would you say after maybe a bit of a, yeah. <laughs> a bit of a roller coaster? Absolutely. And but but those are great lessons to learn when you're when you're younger, and you don't have a lot of capital, you don't have a family or you don't have a mortgage, and, and you're not just looking after yourself. Mm -hmm. you know, and then you kind of get a sense of, of who's trying to build real shareholder value that takes time. And, you know, sometimes you might get lucky with a drill program, or you get the commodity price supporting you. And then I just wanted to gravitate myself towards, you know, people who had built real companies and sold yeah. them or built real companies that had a cash flowing business that you could use that cash flow to acquire other assets. Was there any sort of uh, executive or entrepreneur or anyone in the space that sort of stuck out to you at that stage when you were still a broker, when you were investing your own and other people's money conceivably that where you were like, okay, this is the kind of person I want to work with or, or potentially emulate in some ways at some point. Yeah. So, so when I, when I left the brokerage industry, I was doing some you know, investor relations and corp dev work. And it wasn't until uh, 2009 that I went after the asset for gold standard, but I was introduced to uh, Jonathan Rubenstein and, and Bob mm -hmm. Quarterman. And, yeah. you know, Jonathan Rubenstein is a dear friend of mine, someone that I admire and look up to. And Jonathan was successful in, in uh, co-founding three companies that were all successfully acquired over a 15 year period. And, um, 
you know, Jonathan and his business partner, Michael Kenyon, who's had a, you know, a remarkable career, again, just do real work, super transparent. And I tried to model myself after the way they, they would set up their companies and grow their business. Mm -hmm. um, when I was introduced to Bob, uh, he had um, grown silver standard from a, a 20 cent nothing, you know, 1.5 or $2 million market cap to two and a half billion. And, yeah. um, you know, the way he conducted himself and carried himself when there was the, I'll say, transition out of silver standard, you know, it just I really admired the way he did that. And then in under seven years from acquiring the asset for Predium, to you know, discovery, putting together economics, permitting, raising seven hundred million to first gold pour in under seven years. Mm -hmm. Truly, it's unbelievable. Actually, it's pretty unparalleled, especially in BC, where it's so damn hard to get anything permitted, let alone built so, here. Yeah. So it can be done, and 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 I think the common theme for those two was, you know, when you put your shareholders first and you're aligned with them, you know, they're 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 partners and. Bob has had some of the most loyal retail, high net worth investors, shareholders follow him for, for 30 plus years because of that. You know, it's, it's interesting you say that. Um, when I first moved to Vancouver, and this would have been like 2015, uh, I basically like cold called Rick Rule. And I was like, hey, like I'm new here. I'm Kind of, I'm trying to figure out this sort of junior mining thing. I come from a technical background. I'd love to get your advice. And you know, we talked for probably two hours. And the one thing that really stuck sticks in my mind to this day from that conversation is an example he said. He said, you know, the most important thing you can do is build a constituency of supporters. And he said, the best person I know who has done that is Bob Quartermain. He was like, I'm one of his supporters and I will invest basically, you know, support anything Bob wants to do. And there are a lot of people that feel that way. Um, and he was like, that's it. He's like, if you want to succeed as an entrepreneur or a business owner or an executive or anything in this space, that's kind of the number one criteria to really, to really do that. And, you know, it's, it's interesting to hear you kind of paraphrase that and parallel that totally unprovoked. And, you know, I, I really want to talk to you about your experience uh, uh, building gold standard ventures and how you kind of applied a lot of these lessons. But first, I kind of would love to get an idea of like, what is it that a guy like Bob Portermain is doing that you, and what you learned from him that you kind of took away when you started to build your own companies? Like, what is it specifically that you see that Rick Rule saw that allows him to build that constituency and support from, from everyone, right? From investors, from First Nations groups, from government, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, down, right, right down the line. Well, from my perspective, it was just being aligned with shareholders, putting shareholders first, you know, understanding this is a business and that you need to have successful commercial outcomes. And in order to get there, you've got to have the right people. And you know, Bob, Bob is, is a phenomenal salesman, but he's so transparent. He's so honest and genuine, yeah. and that is, you know, you know, something that's quite that's quite rare. So I just, you know, I saw those things, and you know, again, really tried to model myself after some of the some of the things that he had done and 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 built. And you know, I think it was sort of the way this Dakota was kind of structured and the opportunity that lured him out of out of retirement. But again, just having skin in the game. I mean, I tell all all of our employees. I don't care if it's if it's a thousand dollars to you or a hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars, something that's meaningful to you, where you care if this thing doesn't work out, you need to buy shares or be involved in a financing. Uh, you, you know, you're not just going to get RSUs, and DSUs, and options and have no skin in the game. Yeah, you, you will make different decisions when you're a shareholder and when you have alignment. And you know, w will you drill that hole? maybe in hindsight, you wouldn't drill. And, and, and look, I'm a huge supporter of allowing good geologists to do real work and not have them be um, often confused or conflicted with the market and the capital market side, because that is a different language. Yeah. And, and, and sometimes if you've got a geologist that's super talented and he's running geology and the market, one or the other, or usually both are going to fail. Yeah. Well, you know, you said something interesting about, about Bob and how you see things. It's like it needs to be run as a business. And it's, you know, that is like 
such an obvious thing to say that, you know, it's a mining business that has to be run as a business, but very often you don't really, you don't always see that in practice, right? Like on the one end of the spectrum, every now and then you'll have a geologist or a very technical team that kind of treats it as a bit of a science experiment, right? Like it's like, this is an exciting geological anomaly. Let's understand it better. Where that's, you know, that's part of the problem, but that's not the whole thing. And on the yeah. other end of the spectrum, you've got the promoters that can treat it, you know, generously as a gamble of a roll of the dice and let's see if we can drill some holes and maybe something comes out maybe less generally as you know something a little more nefarious as some sort of pump and dump or, or promotion or, or scam so you know finding that kind of healthy middle ground from the science the technical the the, the curiosity about what you're doing versus the sort of capital market savvy the willingness to take risk deploy capital like it's it it it's it is not achieved more often than not, I would say, finding that healthy middle ground. No, I agree. And, and, I, and I think one of the things that both uh, Quartermain and, and, and Rubenstein bring is just is a healthy, you know, debate being transparent and, and really challenging you. They may agree with, with the strategy or your path forward, but they'll challenge you uh, often playing devil's advocate, even though they agree with you to see if, you know, how much conviction or if, if, if your strategy is well thought through and you thought through what can go wrong? Mm. And, and I think that's also something that, 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 that I've looked to, you know, kind of alter the way I do things. Um, and, and again, just, I cannot come back enough to just that alignment with shareholders. There's, there's just, there, there isn't enough of that in the mining space. And I think that's, yeah. one that's been challenging for the generalists is there's, there's been a lot of things that have blown up and whether it's CapEx blowouts or just the geology wasn't there or, permitting didn't work out. It's, it's a, it's an industry that has not had a great track record of allocating capital, historically speaking. Yeah. Well, so for people sitting at home, you know, it's one thing for the generalist investors, sort of the big funds, private equity firms, you know, even all the way up to the, the capital allocators, like the pension plans who have very experienced, uh, capable research teams, shall we say, but, you know, for the more retail investors who are kind of listening to this and thinking like, you know, that all sounds great. Those are the people I want to invest in these aligned sort of professionals. How, you know, how do they find them? How do how do you how would you recommend someone who's interested in investing in this space? How would they identify these people, these teams that are well aligned with them, are kind of making these kind of decisions that you you credit the Bob Quartermains of the world of being able to make? Yeah, I I think there's there's groups that have just done it with with almost everything they've been involved with. Now, look, we've all had investments or you know that are outright failures for mm -hmm. one reason or another. But you know, it, it's funny you bring up Rick Rule because Rick had a conference a few years ago that at the in, uh, here in Vancouver where he talked about his sort of mining hall of fame, and it was you know it was Friedland, it was Randy Smallwood, it was Quartermain. Yeah. Sean Rosen, you know, um, and then he asked them if, if you could back one young person, who would it be, you know, and like what, what Nolan Watson's doing at Sandstorm and just, you know, people like that, that are just super aligned. And again, I like Marin and I, I think he's, he's so talented and intelligent. He might be aggressive with the way he chooses to word things sometimes, but he really tries to challenge, you know, the principles and the people that he backs, you know, or alignment, you know, be transparent and just, this is a business. You know, if I'm giving you 20 million bucks, how long am I expecting to get a return? What's the upside, but also what's my downside. So I think, I think there are, I mean, there's a number of groups. I mean, the Lundin family has done just a remarkable job of returning shareholder to, to or capital. Yeah. Shareholders. Um, and there's, you know, I also like backing young people and, and, and giving them a shot if I feel that they're aligned with my principles and, and there's people like, you know, obviously Ross Beatty that like to do the same thing. And, and um, I just, a couple of key things. I mean, that alignment with, with, with shareholders, understanding the, that this is a long-term business, understanding the cyclicality of the business and what's the business plan. Are you looking to make a discovery and sell it to a major, which, which is, you know, can be a bit of a pipe dream or mm -hmm. are you looking to build a real business and consolidate a certain region, a certain district. Mm -hmm. I think that there's sometimes certain regions get overcrowded with, with too many juniors. 
And when you're a generalist, you look at that and you say, whoa, I'm getting cross-eyed looking at this map here. There's 40 companies. Do I try to sharpshoot? Do I, do I take a basket approach or, or do, you know, do I say screw it and, and I buy the ETF or buy the physical? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, let's talk about that. And you kind of touched on something that I want to speak about. I'd love to talk about your, you know, one of the biggest wins you've seen in your career, of course, is Gold Standard Ventures, which you guys sold, I believe it was in August, right? For $183, $84 million to uh, Orla Mining. So that was just a few months ago. Uh, you're, you're already kind of back at it again. But, you know, I was talking to you about this before you know, we started recording, but one of the reasons Gold Standard Ventures really stood out to me is that you were able to differentiate yourself in exactly that environment you you kind of just discussed, right? You know, Nevada is is one of the greatest mining jurisdictions on the planet from both a permitting sort of get things done perspective as well as geological endowment. However, because it's one of the greatest mining jurisdictions on the planet, there's a never ending sea of junior mining companies focused on Nevada. And I, you know, I was saying to you, I think like literally once a week, I get pitched a company that's, oh, we've got this historic pit in Nevada and there were a hundred thousand ounces there that were mined by Barrick or Newmont or whoever in the eighties. And, you know, no one's ever explored a depth and we're going to do it. And it's going to be 2 million ounces. And it's, you know, we're bordering up against Barrick and they'll take us out. And like that, I literally hear that story 10,000 times. And the, the truth is one of those companies is going to do that. And it's going to be the next $200 million, billion dollar, whatever discovery. But the other thousand of them are going to be an old pit that had a hundred thousand ounces mined out of it in 1973. How did you guys kind of differentiate yourself and what made you get into the kind of a sea of competition? Yeah. And, and Jamie, just before I get it, really get into it. So, I mean, one thing, a couple of things for me that really were, you know, really stood out about Nevada is the number of juniors that don't actually spend the time and the money doing title work. Mm -hmm. So you don't actually mm -hmm. know who properly owns the asset. And if there is a historical resource, the number of companies that don't actually do proper met work, metallurgy, and it's, and, it, and then, and then you, you know, you can't do certain things on cyanide solubles. And then you've got to do that, that, that work because in Nevada, you're going to have oxide, you're transitional or you're reduced, then you're going to get into sulfide, which is usually refractory. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the problem is there's basically only three or four places in the state to process it, right? Yeah, yeah. Unless it's super high grade or you get that blending value, which Barrick and Newmont have really perfected the art of blending different materials to get that optimal recovery, you're, you're hooped. And then, of course, now in, in, in most parts of the states, water is, is, is often worth more than the gold. And in Nevada, a lot of the um, a lot of the gold deposits are below the water table, so mm -hmm. permitting can be you know, you know can be a challenge. But for Gold Standard, when we you know when I acquired the asset you know over ten years ago, there was there was a large land package that was private. So from a permitting standpoint, it was you know it gave you some kind of flexibility to control the narrative that you knew you were going to get a permit. It was a function of time, and I was fortunate enough to have met someone, um, his name was Dave Mathewson, who used to run Newmont's generative exploration program. And he had tried for over a decade to acquire this asset. And the owner of the project hated Newmont. I mean, just hated Newmont, mm. but liked Dave. And uh, Dave had made the discovery just to the north called Rain. Emigrant was in production and had, and had found a lot of metal. And uh, everyone I asked about, about you know, who, who, who would be the best geologist to partner with, it was Dave Matheson. So when I pitched him this, he knew the asset before I'd even, you know, made him sign a CA and, and, and uh, you know, so, so just the right people, you know, being capitalized. I mean, one of the challenges that a lot of juniors face when they go to Nevada or other parts of the U.S. is you're raising money in Canadian currency. Yeah. By the time you exchange it, especially with what's happened with the strength of the U.S. dollar, mm -hmm. you know it's one point four. So you so you raise ten million bucks if, if you're fortunate enough to do that. You got to have some for GNA, probably your property payments or your lease payments, and then at the end of the day, you don't have a lot of money to actually put into the ground. Yeah. So there's this skewed. Well, you're spending too much on GNA. Well, okay, 
we're losing 40% or 35% right away with the exchange rate. Mm -hmm. And then when I see companies that say, oh, we've got this great target and we want to go underneath and drill deep and we've got 2 million Canadian. I mean, they'll just undercapitalized is, is usually the, a bigger reason why companies fail than, than, than geology. And yeah. there's, there's, and I mean, cool. you see this, right? Like you see this with exploration plays, you see this with development plays, like often they go through two or three iterations before they become a successful mine. You know, the one I comes to mind very easily for me is the Arizona project in Equinox. When I was at Equinox, I mean, we were crack number three at that, at that mine, you know, I think it'd been purchased and explored and almost built and kind of built like two times before that. And then, you know, partnering with Ross Beatty, who is one of the few mining entrepreneurs that doesn't have a shortage of capital. And I think, you know, we priced, you know, a massive payment for like a, a budget for it, like 170 million bucks or something. I'm guys don't quote me on that as years since I've thought about this, but it was, uh, it was, uh, it was a lot more money than a lot of people thought we needed but it was the money that actually like got that thing up into production, all the is technical issues sorted out, away it goes. And then it ended up being like an incredibly profitable asset. It's kind of the, the jewel in the crown of the Equinox portfolio, I would say, uh, from in my opinion. And, uh, you know, people massively underestimate how much it's going to cost to get these things up and going. Now, was this something you were thinking about when you were launching uh, GSV? Or was it something you kind of learned along the way and you were like, shit, we're going to need a lot more money here than I initially thought. Like, how did that, how did this come about? So actually in, in, uh, in 2000, 2001, the owner of this project was being walked around Vancouver by some promoter to, to raise money. So that's when I first heard about the asset. Mm. And then there was, there was an opportunity to, you know, consolidate and roll up this district, which, which, which I think there needs to be more of in the metals and mining space particularly in places like Nevada, where you can get, you know, this checkerboard situation where it's public and, and then, and then private land, or there's just four or five companies that, that have, um, you know, a presence there or a ranching family. So we saw an opportunity to clean up the entire district and there was a lot of historical data. It was contiguous with, with Newmont's rain and, and, and emigrant, and you had a couple of historical resources, mm -hmm. but it was a largely unexplored land package. And, but you had a couple of resources and there was a, you know, sort of a geological view and then actually dark star, there was this historical resource in a different package of rocks and Dave, you know, and I had a different view as to what should be done there. And I wanted to consolidate it. And Mac Jackson, who became vice president of gold standard was really open to it. And mm -hmm. so we ended up acquiring that. And it was four drill holes later, we, we discovered, um, the high grade oxide zone at, at, at dark star, but it was, uh, Mac Jackson, again, vice president of exploration was, was very open to different possibilities mm -hmm. and that led to, to us consolidating that part of the project for peanuts. Yeah. Uh, I think the, I think it was less than $200,000 to acquire the, the balance of, of dark star and, and, and at the peak of the market cap, because it, it had a, those big holes and it was a $900 million market cap. So I think, I think being, being open and, and, and um, you know, recognizing that the, the, this is something that we could move along on our own. It was above the water table, shallow, you know, low strip ratio. And right away we, we spend a lot of time and, and energy on metallurgy, you know, metallurgy mm -hmm. is, is will kill projects faster than grade in Nevada. And so what happened with dark star eventually, eventually. So we, we started drilling dark star and had yeah. those big holes, some of the biggest oxide holes that have come out of the, the state of Nevada in the last 20 years. Yeah. And then we had, you know, you had um, Oceana that, that bought a position and they actually bought a position for the North Bullion discovery, which was refractory, which was sulfide. And we had some monster yeah. intercepts there. Um, and we, we had it set up so we could use a certain portion of the you know, use of proceeds for, for drilling elsewhere in the project. And that quickly became the focal point. And then Gold Corp came in and you know, Ken Ross bought in the open market. So there was this, this expectation that there was going to be a, at least you know, five to seven million ounces of high-grade oxide. Yeah. 
and then so so when you're drilling off a discovery like that that's new that's blind that's not rehashed or recycled yeah yeah it gets really hard to manage the expectations of the market because there's just there isn't a lot of new big discoveries being made especially in a place like Nevada that's been picked over by every geologist in North America yeah so so we were I mean, if you look at all, all of our disclosure, all of our presentations, you know, we never, you know, arm wave publicly that, okay, this is 10 million ounces. We said, look, th th like this is a system here, something, you know, th these are meaningful intercepts. Mm -hmm. like this. But Mac Jackson discovered Leeville, you know, Leeville and not holes 200 or 300. So Leeville does three to 400,000 ounces a year. There's still 10 million ounces. It's part of the NGM, the, the Nevada Gold Mines joint venture yep. between Newmont. Again, not holes 196 or 210, holes one to like 20. And, yeah. you know, so Mac was as interested in the sulfide opportunities underneath the oxide than he was with the oxide because hmm. you get one to five million ounces of oxide and then you'll have an even bigger sulfide system underneath. So I think, I think that project is, you know, Orla's going to be drilling there for, for years. I think they're going to be there for decades. And, and I think they're barely scratching the surface. Okay. So when, when did you start thinking about the Dakotas and looking at land there and partnering with Bob Quartermain and launching Dakota Gold? What was that transition like from, you know, being focused on gold standard ventures, deciding to, to, to sell that company to Orla and then moving into a, you know, a new region, not, not totally dissimilar, but a, you know, a totally new region. Yeah, so so I was shown this opportunity uh, several years ago in in Dakota, and, and I actually passed on the opportunity. And this was a small, uh, poorly financed uh, company that was trading on the pink sheets, which I just I I loathe. And but they had good people that just that just their their background and skill set was not capital markets. Mm -hmm. And this was the last mine manager at Homestake. So I passed on the opportunity a year and a half later, I was shown to me again, and they'd acquired a bit more land and acquired a bit of data. So I went down and took a look. And at this time, Quartermain and I had, had started this little private company and put a bunch of money into it and were looking for opportunities. And I was shown this long section that had the mineralogy and the geology of the old mine. And then where, what Homestake had done in the last few years, the mine was operating. And I showed that to Bob and, and Bob said, well, let's, let's go see that. I want to see that. Yeah. So we went down and this is during COVID. So we had to quarantine for two weeks on the way back. And you'll hear Marin talk about, you know, couldn't leave the house and, and, and uh, you know, family not happy. And, and it was in the summertime, but that led to the really validating this, this, this opportunity. And then if you just a few months before that, um, we were in Toronto and, and uh, at a barrack function before the whole world shut down and, and pitched Mark Bristow this concept because Mark and Bob knew each other from Predium. Yeah, and of course. This, so this would be the third deal during the Mark Bristow era out of the barrack closure group that, that has transacted. So Skeena Resources, that's been hugely successful. Yeah. And K92, another remarkable success story. And you know, the common thread there. So, so when, when, when Barrick bought Homestake, it wasn't for South Dakota. It was for other assets that Homestake had in their portfolio. So right away, this went into the closure group. So one of the deals we did with Barrick gave us exclusive access to all of their data, both inside the old mine and outside the old mine. And the first project we bought from Barrick was called Maitland. And it's actually contiguous with this mine that produced 40 million ounces of gold. And Homestake had made a couple of discoveries on the Maitland project. And that kind of ties the whole district together. And similar to Gold Standard, you know, we've, I've, we've grown the land package from 3,000 acres to 45,000 acres through staking. We've done 38 individual land deals. And we've done these three deals with Barrick. So let's paint a picture for people of, of what you have today. So you have you, home stake is there 40 million ounces produced. What, what state is that mine in today? What's going on there now? Is it on care and maintenance? Is it you know, what? Yeah. So, so just, it's a, it's a, uh, so Barrick owns the surface. We have an option over the surface of the old mine. Mm -hmm. Minerals were donated to the state of South Dakota for a science experiment, which is okay. a DOE funded. They're looking for dark matter and neutrino. 
uh, neutrinos. And so we have all the area basically around that and three miles of this corridor where you have multiple intersections of home stake formation, home stake can put together their own internal resource. Mm -hmm. That's it. it's called home stake formation. And then a few miles to the north, you've got this uh, high grade oxide resource. And that sits on top of the old Maitland mine, which produced a couple hundred thousand ounces at a third of an ounce. But really, every time Homestake would step out, would venture out of the old mine and explore, they, they were successful. And so, Okay. And so when you say the Homestake formation, this is essentially a geological model based on what they've learned there that they're kind of seeing similar versions of this in the surrounding area, areas. So, you know, playing the devil's advocate here, they mined 40 million ounces, you know, a massive, am I getting that right? 40 million ounces? Is that like, am I saying that right? 40 million ounces. That's, I've, I'm saying this to people at home because that is like a shocking number. I thought I might've misheard 4 million ounces, 40 million ounces. 40 million ounces. Is there another 40 million ounce gold mine in like, it, like in the Dakotas or in like, there's not many of them in the world. I'm trying to think about where, I mean, there might be up in like Marathon and Ontario and places in Nevada, but like, it's a pretty unusual to see something of that scale. Yeah, I, I think if you look at Nevada, you can look at complexes, right? Yeah. So, so but, Gold Strike, you know, Miko, yeah. the pit transition to underground. Yeah, yeah. Pipeline, Cortez, you know, Four Mile, Gold Rush. Those are complexes. Yeah, right? and it's often different mines too and different companies. And they're, but like in one, anyways, it's very unusual. So I'm, I'm getting off track of my own question here. So 40 million ounces, you guys have got the ground around it. Why, why stop at 40 million ounces? Why didn't they just keep going? You know, they're making money, presumably. There's, there's prospective so, exploration in the region. Why quit? So in the mid-90s, Homestake recognized that what they had was a finite resource. Mm -hmm. They were faced with, so, so, so there was material, there was, there was mineralization left in the old mine when they shut it down. Yeah. So mid-90s, gold sub-300, Homestake is faced with a, a choice of, do we put three or 400 million bucks into the old mine, refurbish it, new shaft, underground development, refurbish and expand the mill, or do we buy a company called Plutonic Resources in Australia? Mm. They chose to buy Plutonic. And that was really the kiss of death for this mine having any life beyond 1999. So they, okay. they, they chose to shut the mine down. So when Barrick bought it, Barrick actually received a bit of flack in the state of South Dakota for shutting it down. But, but in fact, Homestake had made the decision to shut it down in, I think, 96 or 97. So last uh, production was 2001. So Barrick never looked at it as, as, as a Barrick asset. It was always a closure asset. So when Bristow came in, you know, what really changed was Bristow saying, look, Barrick is only going to have tier one or tier two assets mm -hmm. more strategic. And if it does, it's not in one of those buckets, get rid of it. So when we approached him, you know, he was very commercial, very open and super supportive, largely because of his relationship with Quartermain. So what do you and Bob Quartermain see there uh, for you guys and for your shareholders that, you know, maybe wasn't of interest to Barrick, wasn't of interest to Homestake to prioritize? Like why, what do you see differently? Well, look, we knew we had a really good starting point with our Maitland project in Richmond yeah. Hill. There's four historical resources. Uh, each one has uh, an oxide resource, and then there's this resource in either iron formation or homestake formation. So part of the exploration focus is going to be to convert those four historical resources into compliant ounces. So again, because we're SK-1300 and a U.S. Uh, reporting issuer, talking about historical ounces, e even though some of them have a number of holes into it, we've been kind of really pushed to not do that. So we knew we had a really, really good starting point and something that could easily underpin our valuation. But there was this whole, you know, when Homestake did venture outside of the old mine, they had these large six, 700 meter step outs and mm -hmm. there's penalized Homestake formation throughout the entire corridor. And another opportunity is, is Homestake never assayed for any of the tertiary mineralization in the old mine or outside of the old mine. So they're, and they had such a high cutoff. So their cutoff was seven grams. Mm -hmm. so there's a lot of five and yeah. six material in one-off isolated drill intercepts 
with nothing following up on it. Some of them actually bought them to mineralization. And that was the case at Richmond Hill. Mm. And the fact that this is all private ground, and I cannot under, you know, um, emphasize the significance and importance of having private ground in the US as opposed to BLM or US Forest Service. Because I think when you look at permitting, you have to factor in permitting into, into the commercial equation. And yeah. yes, permitting yeah. On some, you know, I'll, I'll tell you about a, I've got a company called Barksdale Resources that I'm a big shareholder. <laughs> I was just about to say, I have a company in my portfolio. I've yep. been waiting for two years for a bloody permit on, and it's that company. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and this is probably one of the most exciting copper opportunities yeah. in World 48. I mean, this is potentially the source of the Taylor deposit that South 32 bought for 2.2 billion. Yeah. It's on US Forest Service. I mean, some yeah. truly spectacular intercepts. I mean, Peter McGaw is is the CRD god. I mean, this is this is really exciting. Almost five years to get a permit to drill off existing uh, U.S. Forest Service roads. I think in total, there's maybe five beside a fucking mine. Beside like a beside they're built. It's like it's not like uh, people listening at home. It's not this bloody thing is not like down the road for the mine. It's attached. It's like there's an imaginary line drawn there. And they can't drill on one side of the imaginary line. And it's as I also a shareholder in this company, it's endlessly frustrating. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 So, yeah. so I think, I think having that everything <laughs> we're working on now is all on private ground. So I think just a combination of, you know, having the last mine manager at home stake, you know, Jerry Aberley, uh, James Barry, our vice president of exploration made the discovery, what's called the North Drift discovery that Homestake made in the early 90s, that's at our Maitland project, was a mine geologist at Wharf. And then sort of combining the sort of strategic and commercial capital markets experience of Bob and I, and Bob's actually a geologist. So we have a weekly technical call with, with, mm -hmm. our, with our whole team. Bob's super active. And, you know, there's a view that sort of this, this Maitland corridor, um, you know, you've got an opportunity for one or two ledges. When I say a ledge, I mean a gold zone. So in the old mine, there was 40 million ounces that was mined from eight ledges. You've already got the semblance and characteristics of, of you know, building a couple of those right now. And then this Richmond Hill, you know, Lack Minerals was the first company to actually drill underneath the oxide. And they had some spectacular uh, intercepts. And so we're excited. And, you know, management owns almost 30%. You know, Bob and I have almost 10 million bucks into the deal. Uh, we bought shares in the open market. Um, yeah, so it's, it, and it's, South Dakota is a great place to be. So, you know, paint me the, 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 the vision for idiots version here. So you've got a great team. You guys got a lot of money in this. You've got a good track record. You own a big land package. It's got prospective minerals on it. You've got, you know, it's private land. So it makes permitting much more simple and straightforward. What are you trying to find there? Like, what's the goal here? All that thing, like at the end of the day and a year from now or five years from now, whatever, however long it takes, what are you hoping to see there? What we're hoping to see are additional ledges, additional gold zones on the Maitland project, which is contiguous with the old mine, both in the tertiary and in the, in the home stake formation. So oxide and sulfide. And again, on private ground with the added benefit of having all of the barrack data from the old mine from 125 years of mining. Mm -hmm. And so we've got a great place to start. And so we're, we're hoping to uh, discover additional lenses, but we're also hoping to convert what we have now that's historical resources that are, aren't compliant into compliant ounces and build upon that and have this additional kind of discovery bucket following up on on uh drill intercepts that were that didn't make that seven gram cutoff mm. i mean is there a potential for another home stake in the region is there a potential for another you know deca million ounce mine there like is that the hope of what you guys see in for dakota gold i mean i'm yeah. obviously asking you to speculate i'm not you know you're not telling people that that's going to exist, but like, is that why you got into this? Is that the vision there? Absolutely. I mean, it, it was a combination of things, but th this is, this is one of the highest concentrations of gold anywhere on the planet. I mean, if you look at the footprint of the home stake mine, 
it's not that big, but there were 40 million ounces of gold there. You know, there's, yeah. been, there's been 5 million ounces found in the tertiary. But a lot of this land package, I mean, Homestake had the whole district locked up. I mean, you know, Marin was really pushing us to call it, you know, Homestake 2.0, but, but you know, <laughs> Eric wouldn't give us the name. Um, yeah, I mean, th there was a guy that started this whole thing, James Hurst, uh, in 1876, had, had rolled up as much of the district as he could, listed the company on the NYC, and it was the longest listed company in the history of the NYC at 125 years. So and you guys are listed on the New York Stock Exchange now, correct? We're on the NYC American. We had a lot of our Canadian friends that that didn't like the fact that we were just so listed in in the states. Yeah. But we felt an asset and this opportunity, combined with the people, was befitting of a full blown U.S. listing. And it's not to say at some point we won't pursue a dual listing, but I just didn't see the need to pay two sets of listing fees and two sets of legal. Yeah. And the U.S. is the biggest, most liquid capital market in the world. And, and again, we felt that this story, again, deserved that full U.S. listing. And I mean, it's interesting to see that's a very different route than the typical Canadian gold exploration company, right? Like, And your share price and market cap kind of, kind of, you know, speaks to the value of that, right? You've got a 322 share price as of recording right now. Uh, your market cap's what, about $230 million, I think, U.S., yes, is that right? 230 U.S., and, and uh, you know, because of the way the company was set up being, you know, we're a U.S. company. We have a Canadian sub with our U.S. parent company. We okay, were able yeah. to get into the Russell 3000 in June, which which brought in, you know, 10 plus million shares of, of, of volume in an otherwise really challenging market. And, you know, Bob and I have always kind of focused on expanding our, 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 our net network. And, you know, there's 30 or 40 dedicated specialist mining funds in the world. And if you are only relying on, on those funds for money, when the markets turn and they have outflows, you know, you're, you're, you're probably not going to get a very meaningful check. No. Uh, even if they're a shareholder. So, but there's so many family offices and generalists in the U.S. that want to have you know, 5% of a billion dollars into, into gold. Mm -hmm. And we felt that a lot of these American generalists, if they wanted to have exposure to gold, would likely be more inclined to do so if that asset was on U.S. soil. When you say that asset, do you mean the actual deposit or do you mean the incorporation of the company being a U.S. company or both? Uh, both. Yeah. It's very interesting. I mean, it's very interesting for me uh, as someone that's invested in dozens of junior mining companies, a couple of U.S. listed ones. But I mean, like again, this, not like not in any way to discount the value of the land package and the team and the work you've done and the geology. But there are very, very few gold exploration companies today that have north of a two hundred million dollar market cap, right? And you know that being able to easily attract you know that much much bigger u.s investment base compared to the, you know the very tiny canadian investment base that must play play a role in that in in your you know the the interest you get the volume you get uh the liquidity people have uh and you know i mean basically your cost of capital overall am i am i reading that correctly yeah a hundred percent i mean i'm canadian so i can i can say this i mean i, I love canada i just you know, and we were fortunate enough to get that lead order from a Canadian fund in Toronto who, who mm -hmm. was a shareholder in the private company. But we just felt that we're going to be exploring this, this asset in this district for years to come. And we didn't want to raise our money in Canada, deal with the, you know, Forex risk and the currency risk, and then have to exchange money into the U.S. And, and I did that with gold standard. And, and I wish in hindsight, maybe I didn't have that TSX listing for GSV and just went directly to uh, the U.S. So, yeah, I mean, do you think the, the Canadian mining market needs to to really kind of rethink the model that is used here? I mean, you know, you look at, there's no better place in the world than Vancouver or Toronto for the incubation and and creation of new mining companies, right? And new exploration companies. And many of the best discoveries in the world, many of the best companies of the world have come out of the, the, the incubation in these areas. Sure. However, you know, 
I see it day to day, and it seems to be getting worse every year. There is less and less and less capital available to fund these new companies. And it seems to me that a lot of these juniors are fighting over the same tiny, teeny tiny pools of capital that is just kind of recycling from one company and selling it and going into the next and selling it and going to the next. And everyone's clipping at 25% here or a double here or a negative 25% there. And that, that capital is just getting recycled. And there's very little long-term capital that buys into the vision of whatever that company is going to do, build a mine, make a discovery, whatever, and sticks it out for more than, you know, sometimes four months in one day, but, you know, not that long often. It's, there's a, I don't know, I'm kind of on a ramble here, but there does seem to be a bit of a broken system in Canadian mine finance today. There are, there are pockets and, and there are some great uh, funds. There are some great brokers who are in many ways as big or bigger than an institution in and of itself. Yeah. Individual brokers with a big sort of retail and sometimes institutional following, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like a guy that was there uh, on, on the fishing trip, you know, Cam Curry is a, is a, is a gorilla. I mean, when Cam yeah. chooses to back a company, you know, he can own, he can be the biggest shareholder and he's got such a big network and he understands, you know, the cycles. And in many ways, before he gets his full position, he's okay if the stock goes sideways or down because it allows him to get his, you know, his, his, his full position. Yeah. And, and there's that, but you know, Cam's been around the block so many times and there's, he's very selective and is looking for that kind of discovery or resource or near-term production. And he's done exceptionally well. So there are, there are some great people, there are some great brokers, but again, I think there's just part of it is that, that like, there's so many companies and, and as a generalist, I mean, there's, there's thousands of companies to choose from. And where it, I think if you looked at the teams that actually had skin in the game, you know, you quickly, you you know, probably 65 or 70% would go away. Yeah. And then you can focus on the groups that, that are, that are looking to build real businesses and recognize that it's not just the four months in a day, it's three years, four years, five years. Um, so yeah, I mean, is the market broken? I mean, I, I think, I think there's been a lot of good that's been done in the last four or five years. The bigger companies are far more disciplined. You know, the challenge now is, is inflation is making it a lot more expensive to build these mines. Yeah. And I think some of that's lost on, on, on investors. I mean, supply chain issues are, are, are still really challenging right now, yeah. but I think there has been a lot of good. And I, so I'm, 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 I'm excited about the next you know few years for, for us and more broadly about the space. You know, there's a lot of people that are listening to this podcast that are investors and interested in the space, but there's probably an equally large group of people that are people that work in the mining sector, uh, you know, all the way up from, you know, executives and financiers down to people newer in the space, you know, junior geologists, engineers, what have you. And I know a lot of people, because I get a lot of questions about this, are like, well, how do I start a company? How do I get into this? Like, for people who are, you know, maybe have a great idea, maybe have a deposit or an asset in mind that want to go out and and start an actual business and build a real business, like how do you recommend they start thinking about getting money and financing this and like keeping their cost of capital or finding those long-term investors, unlocking those pools of capital? Like where would you if you were to start, you know, if I were to kind of drop you naked in Bay Street and with no contacts in the mining industry, like how would you start today thinking about that, knowing what you know now? Yeah, I mean, I I think when you're building something, when you're when you're when you're you know younger and maybe don't have the contacts as as you would if you're you know older and more established and done it a few times, you know, try to partner with one of those strategic shareholders, and you know, or 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 with someone who has you know is a proven ore finder. I mean, if, if I was looking for an asset and, you know, or had a, had a great asset in BC and, and, it, and, it, and it was a phenomenal project. I'd go and try to find someone like a John Robbins, you know, mm -hmm. someone who's just a, you know, wonderful human being, remarkable success. And there's certain people that tend to be successful anywhere they go. And then there's certain people that tend to be like, you know, BC is their, is their home turf or Ontario, yeah. or parts of Australia or Nevada. And I, I, and, you know, so it's important to have that technical support, but also the financial backing because this is a, it can be, you know, expensive, you know, and geology can, can take a while to figure out and it's expensive to make things into a compliant resource. And then you go through the whole permitting aspect. 
So I think just having having a real team and then maybe not being as as greedy out of the gate. I'd rather have a, a small piece of something going to the moon than a bigger piece of something going to zero. And yeah. I think that, that greed factor kicks in. So I think if you let go and say, you know what, this is the best thing for shareholders, you know, to partner, you know, to, to bring in an Eric Sprott or, you know, a Cam Curry or, or a Marin or John Case, any of these guys who are sticky long-term shareholders who are going to really push you to do what's best for shareholders and, and to operate at a cadence that's befitting and moving this thing forward. Yeah. It, you know, it's a good, it's a really good comment uh, on kind of how you bring in these people to work with you, these older, more experienced people. And uh, when you're talking about that, I was thinking about someone I know um, and who, you know, as well, uh, Michael Connor, the CEO of Vizla Silver, you know, when Mike started Vizla, he was 30 years old. He, you know, he was really a pure entrepreneur. He's not an engineer. He'd never worked at a bank. He just had an idea that he wanted to do this. And one of the brilliant things he did early on was he enticed Craig Parry, you know, an excellent financier, but equally importantly, an excellent geologist to partner with him. And he did that by making Craig and a massive shareholder in the company he was building. And it was very, very smart. He found a very talented person. And he incentivized him to and aligned him with himself to work together. And you know they've created, you know, made a phenomenal company. They've made great discoveries, and it's been a you know a phenomenal partnership for that. And I think there's so few people that kind of have that generous attitude, but also that sort of strategic, like, okay, you know, you're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna like. It's kind of a game of singles, game of doubles. It's not you're not necessarily looking for that one home run right out of the gate. It's the ability to kind of repeat this and do this and build companies and make discoveries and entice people to work with you. And I think, you know, that's a very good mentality to have. Yeah, that's actually a really good point because people only see the successes. They don't see, you know, the failures. They don't see how hard you have to work and how challenging mother nature is. And then you've got governments and permanent yeah. energy and et cetera. So I think just partnering with someone who's been through cycles before, who's had successes, who's gone through failures. And so if, if you're able to save time, energy, and money and, and keep your health by partnering with, you know, the right people and build a real business, yeah. I mean, that's really, really important. You know, if you're an investor at home and you're kind of thinking like, all right, this is a nice conversation, guys, but how the hell does this apply to me? Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to bring it full circle now because- you know, I've had the chance on this podcast to interview dozens of people, some of the most successful people in the sector, the Ross Beatties and the Frank Justras and the Rick Rules. And something I, I really noticed kind of all of them had in common was that they did have a lot of successes, but they also had failures. They all had so so had setbacks and they had projects that didn't work out and, you know, discoveries that weren't there. And what they were all really kind of good at is not putting all their eggs in one basket too early on, maintaining momentum, getting exposure to a lot of things. And then when something really was successful, that, you know, that big discovery or that great, they were, they focused and concentrated on that. And I've tried to mirror that as much as I can as an investor, right? I kind of will spread myself across different things and get exposure. And I try not to get over allocated to any one project or any one company. But when you do see something succeeding and you see that, okay, this really is potentially a special asset or deposit or team or what have you, then starting to concentrate more and more on that. And I think it's it's a good lesson for people as investors at home that like, you know, if you're not willing to lose money, then you probably shouldn't be investing in the mining space. But it's also about losing money strategically and and building that strong portfolio approach and being able to to understand when you've got a great project and concentrate on that, but, you know, also willing to clip your losers as they, as they come up, which is inevitable. Um, I don't know if that resonates with you at all in, in your career, but that's a lot of what I was thinking about in this. Yeah, definitely. And, and when I invest in, in, in companies, I mean, often it's, it, 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 it can be an idea and it's a private company. And, you know, I, I like being aligned with, with the principles and management and, and will sometimes do, you know, multiple private placements over, over a number of years. And for some of the early stuff, I mean, obviously it's important to look at preservation of capital. And, and at least if you're in a position where there is liquidity and you can sell a portion of your position and have no risk in the game, mm -hmm. then it just, it just, then you can afford to kind of 
you know, maybe be more patient and have a longer term view. But again, all these opportunities take, you know, years to build. I mean, very, yeah. very few can just come out of the gate swinging. They happen, they exist. And, that, and that's maybe what a lot of people are chasing. And, and you can get those kinds of returns in the mining space. But more often than not, it's, you know, it's building and it's, you know, you, you'll, you'll have some sniffs, raise a bit of money, go back, figure it out, maybe not quite there yet. And then maybe round three or phase three, you make that discovery. Yeah. You know, John, we're coming up on about an hour now. And, and is there anything I haven't asked you uh, about, about Dakota, about Gold Standard, about what you're working on today that you want to talk about or touch on? No, I, I, I think we've covered, you know, a lot of the bases, Jamie, this has been, this has been great. I really appreciate th this opportunity and, and uh, no, I, I, I've, 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 you know, kind of walked through my, my, my principles and, and, um, you know, we talked briefly about that up, up in, up in fishing and, you know, a book that I read that really helped change the way I look at things and the way I operate is called principles by, by Ray Dalio. Mm. And I had met him, you know, years ago at a Tony Robbins function and just kind of was, completely enamored with with the way he conducted himself and and uh so I, so I think everyone needs to have their own set of principles whatever that is and um certainly when it comes to investing all right well thank you very much john very much appreciate you taking the time today thanks jamie really appreciate it and for everyone listening at home if you want to learn more about what john is up to go to dakotagoldcorp.com and you can see everything you need there all right guys thank you very much for listening John, thanks again for coming. Thanks, Jamie.